Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Gee whiz, I don't know. I mean, I've, with all that turkey I ate this past weekend, I don't know if I'm going to be here today. But anyway, it was quite a it was quite a day. Hopefully, everyone enjoyed the holiday, and it seems as though we had we had good weather here in the mm-hmm. in the Portland metropolitan area, and it was fantastic. As you know, we did the last week. We did we had quite a show, and and uh, we talked about a number of issues. We had the, uh, we had Black Lives Matter on. We we talked about. Uh, uh, we, we had Roy, I'm sorry, Royal Harris, who's here. He's here with us today. We talked a little bit more about um, some of the issues we're happening in the community, whether we, whether we police, gang, and whatever. But we didn't really spend that much time. But it was sort of like an introduction, and we said we wanted to re- revisit that particular area. And the other area was naturally we talked about the idea of, of, of police and and just kind of giving them a better feel of what the definition of quote gangs. You know, when, once you once you get these labels and everything, the major concern is naturally was our youth especially during those formative years because once they get that on that record it's hard to shake and so what we're going to do this particular show is that uh, we're going to just go on and, and follow up with what we said we were going to do today we're going to try to give you a far better definition of, uh, of what gangs are all about and then uh, hopefully we can come up with a solution and, and get that label off as much as we possibly can especially during the formative years and yeah. and so these young people will be able to, well they are our future i mean that's, that's basically what the bottom line is and then, uh, then naturally, we talked about that the other issue was police, and, and and spending a little bit more time about police, more specifically here in the Portland metro area. And my, so, anyway, I've got the probably the only guy that I know of uh, within the city of Portland right now that's that's willing to come on. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, Portland's finest, and, and I'm talking about Don Dupay. You know, Don's been, in all due respect, Don has been here on the show for a number of times, and and uh, he's written a book, and it's been a, it's a very fine book. It's called Behind the Badge in River City in Portland, Oregon. And I think, you know, I realize there are issues all over the country. Every every area, every state in the union has its issues. But the fact of the matter is we want to become like focus and target, if you will, Portland, Oregon, because that's kind of like the, the, the Portland, Oregon it is the so-called issue, gang, all that other good stuff here in the, in the state of Oregon, so to speak. And I think once you resolve that, if you resolve that entity, then it pretty well spreads and then it just kind of prevents the issue from going on. My idea is to make folks inclusive and get them engaged so that we can have, if you will, uh, the, the, a beautiful place, if you will, to live and reside and families and all that good stuff and whatever. So anyway, so Don, welcome. Thank Good you, sir. As usual. It's a pleasure yeah. to be back. And this is this is that Talk this about is that the fine, history of Portland. Yeah, and that Portland Police Memoir. I like that. I like that. Yeah. So look, guys, let's just jump right up in this piece. Uh, again, maybe we should start off with... Uh, Let's do the gang thing, and then John, okay. Don, we can. In fact, we'll, we'll kind of like start off with you from the standpoint of what, how, what, what was the what was the definition during your days as a, as a Portland policeman, as it relates to young people and whatever. I worked the streets of Albina, which is the area we're sitting in now, which is northeast Portland. Northeast Portland, Portland from 1961 to 1967. 1967, I was promoted to detective, so I had uh, all those years right here on the street. And it was a different time. Uh, when you say gang, the only thing that came to my mind and the only gangs we had then were there were two. The black gang was the Panthers. Mm-hmm. There were thugs and crooks. And the white gang were the motorcycle guys. Mm-hmm. There were hardly any black people in the motorcycle gangs. It was strictly we ride our bikes, we do our thing. Uh, those were the two gangs that we had. So. I never had anything to do with the motorcycle gangs because they weren't exactly in my era, in my area. In Albina, my district was pretty small, uh, from the river to 15th Street and from Killingsworth to Fremont, and occasionally we slopped over down into Russell Street when things got tough. But the only gangs were the Black Panthers. The, the Black Panthers? The Black Panthers. Now, the Let me tell you about Panthers, the Black Panthers. Okay. Doing, doing, the, doing I, your era, right, okay. In my area. Before... They became Panthers. You know, we keep we kept track of all of the the burglars, the the, the cigarette thieves, and Fred Myers, the what you call today petty thugs, petty thieves, petty thugs, and the names of those people I can give them to you, and I have some of them in my book because it's public record, but they became the Panthers when the Panthers became. Oh, it's like oh now we have a name, we have something to join, this is what we're doing, 
and then they they unfortunately they did a, they did a great thing with the the, the King School program trying to uh, feed the children do the right thing but they went about it the wrong way they went about it by terrorizing and coercing the merchants along Union Avenue mm. specifically McDonald's uh, that used to be on the corner of uh, Union and Fremont, now MLK and Fremont. Uh, all those merchants along Weimer's Hardware Store, uh, uh, there used to be a department store down where the Nike p uh, place is now. It's called what's called the Lapis Department Store. Lampus. They put the muscle on all of these businesses. Muscles like how? Muscles like, you need to give me some money. They walk in two or three at a time, all dressed in black and intimidating. We need this much money for our program from you this week. We'll be back next week. And I know that for a fact because I took the complaints from these merchants. So while they were doing the right thing, they were in fact a kind of a criminal conspiracy to feed the, to feed the children. So that was what the, that's what the gangs were to me then. But now, in all due respect, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't from here, but, the, but I know who Kent Ford is all about. And I know that Kent was his, his position that I've known him. And in fact, I interviewed him a couple of times on that peace aspect of it. But the day was the idea was this, the idea there was a lack of IE servicing the, some of those kids that were out there, you know, as far as activities and food, and they would give out baskets and you know right. Christmas holidays and this that and the other, and and then so I guess that's the that's the other side of the deal. He was one of the ones that was in my book, mm -hmm. in my mugshot list. Mm -hmm. As a thug, okay, you know, because that's what they were. When you steal, when you burglarize, and I got your mugshot. Mm -hmm. Here I thought, but now, so I take it you now he's an old man. Okay, okay, but <laughs> but me. still, but still, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to qualify someone wanting to do something good. Yeah, yeah. I kind of step in because yeah, I think you can't do something good by doing something. Bad. I, I, think, think, I think I think I think first I could challenge that just by saying America was built on that premise. So we can say you can get something good by doing something bad. Ask the Indians, ask the Protestants <laughs> and everybody in Manifest Destiny, <laughs> and ask the Indians. You can do good. Ask the slaves, ask the Chinese who built the road. So that one you can always argue. What okay. I can say is what he presented as gangs during his era is a classic example of what has led to gangs in this era. Because okay. what he said is, what he talked about was young individuals, young people, and I don't say it to slam him because I understand from a law enforcement perspective, mm -hmm. as we were kind of saying before it started, is his perception was they had committed these acts that were against the law, mm -hmm. which had created this definition for them from a law enforcement public safety perspective. On the other side, you have young people who in pretty much 1960s racist Portland, which still had redlining all the way through the state sanctioned, yeah. that they looked at it as the man. So what they were saying is, do you people in my community are blood suckers? So we'll take from you to get our own stuff started. Well, you have two diametrically opposed people on a continuum. Oh. So mm -hmm. from there, but what it speaks to a larger issue is behavior judges what people are interpreted as. Because mm -hmm. if they would have been just some kids taking beers and getting drunk at the store over at Franklin, they'd have been those rowdy kids. Once That's in have, Northeast Portland. No, right? Franklin's Southeast, right off of 52nd, 52nd okay, and Division. Yeah. So, but, and again, like we were saying, if, he, if it would have been some rowdy kids in Felony Flats, might have been a different identification. Is that Northeast Portland? Southeast Portland. Okay, I'm just In an all-white neighborhood, so I can make oh, it okay, clear. Okay, so, okay, okay. identity shapes it. Behavior shapes it. Because again, some people only saw them making opportunity to feed kids. Some people saw the mechanisms that they provided an opportunity for others. So it's how you view behavior. If you look at a lot of gangs, which travels to today, most gangs, if you look at what we consider gangs, are young people who grew up together and hang out. Mm -hmm. Now, they might create, they might do the reckless things young people do. But what happens is they, get, they go from being children making mistakes to what do we label their behavior? as a gang because here's what we have to look at the origin of the work the origin of the construct of gang starts in new york with immigrants it doesn't yeah. become part of the black collective until then you get to the 60s with the kids in chicago who are trying to create street organizations but the government and the mayor and those guys in the daily regime didn't want to give them resources but they could give them drugs as guys were coming yeah. back from war now you travel that all the way to the hispanic communities in l.a or the Bloods and Crips in L.A., where all these young people have collected mm -hmm. without opportunity, and they try to do it the right way, and then as young people do, they create self-sufficiency on their own. But what happens is this. It's, not, it's against what the system wants. So what do we do? We label them. 
And definition of system? The system. I can say, we can say a political system. Okay. We can say a governmental system. We could say any kind of system that's built to structure how we live our lives, vis-a-vis -vis the mm -hmm. public safety system, system, what we call the police. Mm -hmm. And like I was, like he and I were saying before now, there are certain dynamics where what public safety deems important from a systems level doesn't match what people get. And like we were, like I told him, at a thirty thousand foot level, there's somebody writing a policy for police at fifteen thousand foot level to enforce on ground level people. That's true. What happens is we have this interplay between these two groups when the puppet master's up here playing with everybody. <laughs> the policy that they teach in school and in the police academy is not what comes down on the street. Uh -huh. It's, you know, it's in some, time, some places it's totally different because what they tell you to do in the academy, your first day on the street, your coach says, forget all that shit. Mm -hmm. This is the way it is. This is street level. This is police work. Put on your gun. But Don, doesn't but Don, but doesn't the public doesn't the public recognize the fact that they are the ones that are the policy makers? No. No. No, they don't. No, but my point is that they elect someone, if you will, <coughs> and represent them, the policy maker, right? What they elect is the person who speaks to their fears, not um. the needs of the community. If I'm tough on crime, it's usually because I've made a boogeyman. Now that I've made a boogeyman, what I can do is get you to invest resources in what I want to do. As we can look at right now with Donald Trump, he who yells the loudest can be the dumbest and still be heard the most. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got the money. Okay. You can be loud and I'm not. All right. So, so now, what about solutions? Let's talk about solutions. We've said it we've said mm -hmm. quite a bit, and a lot of the idea is what, what do we? How do we stop this and start getting back to the to the basics of what we need to resolve the problem? Our, our youth, if you will, education, right? No. The first, no the first, the, no, the first, the first thing that has to happen, the label gang violence has to go away, and it just has to be gun violence or youth violence. By whom? By everyone. Young youth violence. It needs to be youth violence because here's the thing. You're, I think, oh, and right. I think the second thing has to be the driving mechanism has to quit being law enforcement, and it has to become public health because violence and the trauma that comes along is part of the public health spectrum. Law enforcement dealing with the outcomes of that, that's public safety. But who creates these entities? The is entities it, it already the exist. But is it not the, uh, the, the public? It's supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The they elect, if you will, the, the so-called policy implementers, if mm -hmm. you will, because they're the one that's supposed to be giving them the guidelines, and then they put, put it in a, in a perceptive you know. that basically gets yeah, enforced but what by law enforcement officers. But, w but what we're talking about now, as if we're talking solutions, Yes, right, right. We, okay. we have to go upstream. And upstream, before there's ever involvement with him to deal with it on a ground level, there's 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 community trauma, there's individual trauma, there's lack of education. But these are all mechanisms that are better addressed through the public health lens, which can be proactive upstream than the law enforcement lens, which is at the bottom of the pile, reactionary and best good as a data collection. Data collection down here for the police is how many did you arrest? Yeah. What did they look like? Yeah. What was that for? They can't be part of the solution because they're still their number one job. They're, is, wait, they're waiting to basically get the guidelines to implement. Their number one job is public safety. If we take away the trauma and all the mechanisms that put kids in a position to afflict trauma on others, we minimize the need for public safety okay. because we've already developed, we've already engaged it. And we have a public health department in Multnomah County. Okay. Now, you say, again, you said department. Mm -hmm. And who, who, who basically generates that department? Who generates it? Yes. Who puts it together? Uh, Doesn't it come? It's, it still comes from the public, right? Mm -hmm. Either an elected official, right, mm -hmm. who represents them, mm -hmm. right? Yes, fair? I, that's fair. And you and you, you're calling it public. You, you call it mental health, right? I mean, public. You, you're calling it public health. Mm -hmm. and, and give us a, expand a little bit more about this definition of public health and how you relate that to what we're talking about. Okay, in Multnomah County, we have a public health department which covers mental health. It covers environmental health. It covers the spectrum of health needs and health issues in Multnomah County. Anybody interested, I would say go to Multnomah Health, Multnomah County dot gov, go to the public health department, and you can learn everything they do in an incredible department. But what I mean by that is looking at health. If we want to eliminate violence, right, okay. if we want healthy children, if we want healthy communities, we have to look at what health means. And right. if you look at the World Health Organization definition of health, it doesn't mean that you are free of illness. 
It means everything that you can promote to have a positive life where you're fulfilling and living up to what you would want and you're maximizing your potential. Mm -hmm. With that said, we would have to look at your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, your spiritual health, your economic health. Now, if we address those things and take deficit out of it by, pro by creating programs, creating resources, and creating services that are upstream, because once a person's already in the criminal justice system, trying to do those things you're trying to you can't you can do it but it's throwing money into two situations mm -hmm. at once mm -hmm. you still have to interface with law enforcement about how they allocate or what they view as a priority but if you do it through this mechanism using the community as the driver using the community at a more grassroots level to interface with the public health department which is geared to interface with the community then you can get a community up solutions to these you present them to them in that manner Mm -hmm. Now, when you deal with law enforcement, you let law enforcement know. One of the one of the easiest ways, and he talked about it with 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 law enforcement, have officers walk through neighborhoods, know the kids, know the adults. Yeah. Yeah. If you really want to look at it, and if you want to look at it from an economic <coughs> level, like we were just talking, one of the things that made it easy for him is economically. If you don't have gentrification and you have static neighborhoods where community can develop, you can develop relationships. When you have people hop bopping around between apartments with young people. And it's a public safety issue. It's not. It's not. There isn't the time for relationship building. Then is then is crisis intervention. And okay. for, when you have that, that's when you get the inappropriate use of race as part of how you look at people. That's when you get reactionary police. That's when people <coughs> object are objectified by police because now, uh, now they go from Mrs. Such and Such or little Such and Such to them. Okay. Am, am, yeah. I, am I in you're line? Right. You're right. You're now, right. I'm listening to this stuff, but as a layperson, I'm the layperson. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And this is the first time I've heard that public health in Multnomah County is coming in here to deal with the whole issue of gangs. No. Because in all due respect, it's always been the city of Portland. Well, you got the city of Portland over here. They're Portland police. you mm -hmm. got Multnomah County, which is over here. Mm -hmm. And they're dealing with their issues or social issues or whatever. Mm -hmm. But my point is that, so, so now, these, you got two separate entities. Mm -hmm. But the cry is still, we got gang members here. Wh who's doing what? And are we in the process of working to solve these problems? Here's the thing. Multnomah County in the city. Should Do we need a, a Multnomah County? Here's what you said. You asked me, you asked me <laughs> if we go away from the problem to the solution. Those are all the things that if we were to create the solution in my ideal world, I think should be done. But that's also because I've interfaced with the city. I've interfaced with the county. But I think more important as an elect, as an informed citizen, you should know about your city. You should know the resources available to your electorate. But that's you, the issue. They don't. I wouldn't say they don't. Or is the question, we, it's twofold. Does, do those entities do enough to educate people? The that's second the, part to that is, that's the, that's the, the second part is, is it their responsibility to educate you if they make them information available? And B, how do we as community members use forums like this to let people know this information exists? But in all due respect, you know, as a lay person, you know, I'm just working every day, mm -hmm. eight to five type routine, coming home, trying to, you know, basically feed my face, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about eating, okay? Mm -hmm. I got I got a heck of a lot of responsibility. Uh, during election time, I'm told that, hey, look, I'm going to get someone to take care of the issues that you mm -hmm. were talking about. And, I, and they come out and they, well, all the flowery, whatever, you know, kissing the babies and all that other good mm -hmm. stuff. And they say, okay, elect me and I can solve your problem. And then all of a sudden I come home one night and my place has been broken in, or if not that, I got unruly kids out in the streets and I'm told they're gang members. I got all kinds of problems, but it's not being taken care of. Why don't you walk outside and talk to the kids? Why don't you? You, know, you a, can't do why that. You, yes, you can. Why? I, I, I can you you open that. your door. You say, hey, my name is, my name is Royal. What's okay. your name, young man? Okay. Uh, can I just ask why you out here doing this? Is you know, because I live right here and I don't want I don't want a problem with you, but I do like my home. And I guess here's my question. And here's where I lay it on the on the footsteps of every citizen. OK. Why can't you go do it? Why can't you go do it? Why can't you take an hour before you watch that silly show on TV, whether it be Empire, whether it be one of these shows, How to Be a Millionaire. Show, why can't you take that hour and get on the Internet or get on your smartphone and just look up resources available to you as a citizen to change your community. But we're electing leaders to do that. No, 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 but The no, leaders no. are not telling us what you're just sharing with I us. I guess it's like this. I'm my own leader. Anybody got to tell me how to be smart? Mm -hmm. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don, how, how does that, I like, how, how I does that reflect? I like it. I like it. Because the police uh, 
are not dealing with it as well as they can or should, mm -hmm. and they shouldn't be ta they, they shouldn't be tasked with a lot of that stuff, which is you're talking about social work, a lot mm -hmm. of social work. They shouldn't be tasked with it, but you got to Frederick Douglass says you got to get them early, or you, you can't you can't correct the man. You got to correct. You got to start the children. It's too late when they get to be a man. But but once the other issue there is that once they get to be these criminals, then you've got to have some responsibility. You've got to, if you kill a couple of people, you go up here to Alberta Street and shoot and kill somebody by accident or on purpose, you should be in jail. You should be in jail for a long time until you figure out you messed up. You can't do that. That's not acceptable in the community in, in, in general and the black community in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes me mad when uh, it's the white policeman who keeps getting accused of shooting everybody and actually... White people kill white people, black people kill black people, and what the hell have the cops got to do with much of it? Really not. <laughs> Clean it up. <laughs> really not much of it. But I guess you said, I, I want to thank you for saying something, which is that white people kill white people and black people kill black people, because that's really what happens. Yeah. And, and I think too often we demonize white people for telling the truth, and it's just the truth. And, and, but because I think to me, what happens is it gives others a view to how the world looks from that perspective not yeah. that you have to agree or disagree because mm -hmm. like you said some stuff that i had to really think well okay he's telling me from a white guy's eyes living in a white world in a white organ how it looks to him mm -hmm. now i don't agree with everything but that's just what it is but it also but we also found so much commonality because bullcrap is bullcrap no matter how you color right. it mm -hmm. you, know? Mm -hmm. you know and corruption is corruption mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know am i hearing also too in the conversation we're having here that that the police has Besides those specifics in terms of law enforcement, those those those, those training items that they're specifically mm -hmm. supposed to be identified with, all these other added pieces which they're that's not on their plate becomes part of become part of their job, if you will. Mm -hmm. am you I, can am speak I to that, that better than I can. On? I'm is, having is a little the, trouble hearing you. Is the bucket list too is is, is no. overflowing? No. And when it comes to doing doing the work, if you will. The bucket and are list. you trained to do specifics in the bucket list, or is it just uh, you, you're trained to do anything and everything? Policeman is trained to take care of everything, and that's one of the problems. But problem. is that your job, though? Yeah, it is. It's in the job description. That's, you that that the is radio. the job. It, does you it answer say, the radio. No, but does it say do everything? It says you answer the radio, and if the radio calls about a bum on the street corner pestering somebody, you take it. If the calls about a guy that shot somebody in the back, in, a, in a, the convenience store, you take the call. But should you be should you be doing that social work on the street of taking the, uh, the homeless guy to a shelter? Is that police work? No, but, that's but, not police. But work. that's expected, though. It's expected because because the police police seem to be the babysitters for for the community. When everything goes wrong, call the cops. If I can't figure it out, call the cops. Well, the, because because the cops have to come. Now, are you trained to do all of those things? Yes, you are trained. You to are do trained. All so why are we having the problem? We're having a problem because white people are afraid of black people. We need more policemen with better training. I mean, the fact that we got only 950 officers now is ridiculous. Yeah. Really when I was a cop in 19, when I was a detective in 1977, 8, and 9, we had 85 detectives. We still got 85 <laughs> detectives. And you know what that tells me? Burglary cases, for instance, aren't being worked at all unless somebody's caught at a grocery store. Mm -hmm. That's the only time any burglary case will get worked. Auto theft, out the window. Car theft never really was a, a, a crime, and now it's even less of a crime. So that just goes out the window. I had a, I had a case load that's that thick when I was a detective of burglary cases. And when I worked homicide, we were so shorthanded with homicide detectives, I worked three homicides by myself. I mean, that's unheard of today. Mm, mm. You send out one detective on a murder? Mm. No. Mm. Well, Don, We've got to have more policemen. Have we have, we have but, to but, have more policemen. Well, let's get back. You made another statement that was kind of very interesting. You said black folks, black folks don't like white folks and white folks don't like black people. No, I said black people kill black people yeah, yeah. and white, white people, people kill right, white people. So, yeah. so now are you trained, so are you trained to, uh, well, uh, trained to, to maybe resolve that, engage that piece when you're no. going through training in terms of how to get along with black folks and white, white folks, that no. kind of a deal? 
Or better yet, I thought I thought the solution during the early days was a again affirmative action where they basically put blacks on, Hispanics, Asian women. Am I? I don't fix nothing. That's society. You can you can put a, the one of each on everything and still have one racist person who still don't like nobody. Now I just got a cornucopia of people to hate. Okay, okay, yeah, but you exactly. Point, that's but, true. But the exceptions was that was part of the exceptions, right? Putting more putting more officers uh, of color, if you will, right? And yeah. women and a whole nine yards, right? Yeah. Was there an acceptance by the ones that were there to begin with? There were some exceptions. There were never an acceptance of women from the mainstream, you know. Okay, why was that? Because women are deemed girls and they shouldn't be in police work in a car mm -hmm. with a uniform, carrying mm -hmm. a gun. Mm -hmm. They're fine in social work and in my opinion that's where they should stay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get in trouble for that, but I've already said it in the book. Uh, it's not a woman's job. It's a man's job. And it's a big man's job. Mm -hmm. Never, one of the mistakes affirmative action, as you speak of it, did was they dropped all the rules. Now you can be five foot two and be a policeman. That's messed up. A policeman should never have to look up at a perpetrator. They should always be able to look down. It's a deterrent it's, kind it's, of thing. It's just a... It's just a psychological uh, maneuvering of of who's who's got the top ground. Listen, I think listening to that, that's just why you need affirmative action because that, as much as you sound cool so far, that's the typical pro Anglo Protestant white male authoritarian not, view. It, and, and I'll tell you why. And I only and I don't say it like that. Don't sound right to you because you're a white guy. So I will see why you see it that way. But on the other side, I wouldn't mind that five foot two Hispanic lady because in a Hispanic community, the white guy who comes in with that attitude, nobody's going to listen to. Where her, she might actually be able to say something and say, "Okay, you look like me. I'll listen to you." And I think, especially as it relates to a multiple multiple groups living in a pluralistic society. Well, what works best is if I see somebody who looks like me, the likelihood that I will see something that I can find a, a, a co-humanity in is it works. My daughter sent me an article about a country in Europe, very white country. One of the things they noticed, crime doesn't happen. One of the things they noticed, people found it difficult not to see the humanity in people who look like them. This country was founded on overseers not seeing the humanity in people who didn't look like them. That was the precursor to law enforcement. That's why I say that Protestant, Protestant Anglo-Saxon view. That's what's come with this country. It's in the fabric of how we do law enforcement. Not well, good or well, bad, well, it is. Let me throw this on the table. In one of the interviews I had with, uh, with Don, he made mention about the whole idea of physical, you know, the idea of deterrent aspect mm -hmm. of it. The, a shorter person being able to look up, you know, because that's, that's why you're wearing your uniform, you know. What mm -hmm. I mean? And then, but being bigger than, if mm -hmm. you will, and then hopefully that will, that will, that will. Now here's yeah. now. Let me take that. Let's talk that. Let me talk that. And that's I asked what he in, mo up. in most minority communities, who is the most authoritarian, revered, responded to person? The mother. How many people have a mom taller than them? So that throws the whole height thing out. So as we talk about authority and respect, it's the reverence for the position and how a person carries that position. And you feel that stands to good today? I know police I like because they carry themselves with integrity. I I'm, talking about, I'm talking about uh, young people respecting moms today. Yeah. You now, feel, but here's the you deal. You feel just as comfortable? You feel comfortable? If, if, if you carry yourself in a way that deserves respect, yeah. If you don't, you probably won't get it. Just like with cops. You see a lot of cops who come in talking like they own a neighborhood, like they own a situation, like because I got this badge that, that I'm better than you, except at eight o'clock when I take it off, you wouldn't say the same thing to me without your gun or your radio. Is that really, you have authority or is that really you're imposing a will on somebody? Okay. And if you impose a will continuously on people in the community, what do you think they think of you? Okay. Don, how do you break that? The other, the other side of the coin is this, the shorter the person, the bigger the Napoleonic syndrome. Mm -hmm. You got the short man syndrome and you get a shorter cop and they've already got the short man syndrome. Then you put a uniform and a badge on them, it, it creates a bad, what started out as a bad person, it creates a tyrant. And there's too much of that. You say you don't get that with six foot tall white cops? That, that, that Napoleonic you know, you, no, tyrant syndrome? No, no, I can, no. if, it, if it wasn't for the fact we don't hear, I could tell you at least four cops that I know exist like that right now. Okay, so, well, and like I say, I don't say it to say that you don't have generally your opinion. All I can say is from a, like you say, you were an 18-year law enforcement officer. You came in tall. and you're six feet tall. <laughs> you came in in 1971 and only seven years before had the laws made it illegal for blacks to buy houses in the neighborhood. Yeah. You saw, so, 
61? 61. So that means yeah, yeah. 61. So about the same time of that stop, which means you were probably trained by somebody who was Billy Bob, I don't like black people. And you had to fight that, which I don't disagree well, now, with. Remember now, the training part. You know, I'm not trying and to, I'm going to go to that. The but, training part is that they're, they're specifically trained for specific, that. That's included in the training. Here's the one thing I do know, because I work with parole and probation, gonna, and I can answer couple, this couple more minutes today. The real measure of an officer is not when he entered the when he entered the ranks. It's the attitude, the culture, and the time that his person who trained him entered. Because all of the soft skills of the job, that conversation, how to look at people, what you should be afraid of, how who's always been this way, that's what you learn there. Am I right or wrong? You're right. Okay. You're right, to an extent. To an extent. What's, the, what's the other part of the extent? <laughs> you'll, you'll get that. Well, look here. We're going to go on and take a short break. We'll come back. This has been very interesting. Folks, we'll be right back. Get your coffee, get your drinks, and come on back to the table. We'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. We're having a very interesting conversation. We've been talking about gangs. And now we're getting right into we We started talking about police. And I think it's a very, very important piece because there's a, there's a bridge there that we've got to hopefully, you know, shorten, if you will, so if people can walk across and work this thing out. Because we do need, we still need public safety. And uh, the whole idea that in the definition of public safety about the, the whole issue of mental health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all these other things that goes in with, with that uh, whole issue of public safety, boy, I mean, it's, it's been very, very enlightening, if you will. So we're just going to right, go right back to, the, to what we were talking about in regards to the whole issue of police again and uh, how do we get to that action. solution and the affirmative <laughs> action piece. In fact, in fact Don, you, you smile, so we're going to throw that back on the table. Earlier. Now, the whole, the whole purpose, as I thought, uh, the the uh, the whole purpose of affirmative action with the, within the department was basically talking to what Roy was talking about. You know, people looking like them. In fact, that's what they're doing now. Saying, okay, fine. Yeah. They, they just got a they just got a, a, a an Arab, if you will. I think not too long ago, one one Arab, and then you know, then you've got you've got Hispanic police that are on the force, Asian, police. and you got Asian mm -hmm. and this, that, and the yeah. other. But in all due respect, a lot of times I don't see them. <laughs> now, what what do they get? Do they get? Are they are they inclusive in the force as a as a hotel? Well, I don't know. You don't very often see them. That's true. Yeah, I see a lot of policemen. I'm downtown a lot. Right. When I go to Port PSU, uh, and I, I I rarely see an Asian policeman. Hmm. Uh, when I came on the police department, and when before before I came on in 1960, I didn't know Portland had any black policemen. And it wasn't until I joined in 1961 and got signed sworn in that I found out, oh yeah, we got seven or eight or nine or ten cops that are black. But the city hid them. Mm. They hid them in radio. They hid them on a graveyard shift. They worked out in Selwood, you know, when nobody calls the cops. Mm -hmm. And uh, they worked in the jail. Mm -hmm. So the city had policemen, but they hid them. That's, mm -hmm. That was the city's, that was their, their bad thing they did. Mm -hmm. And the first black policeman that I can remember that was out and over it with Dick Bogle. Uh, Dick Bogle. He, he's the first one I was mm -hmm. introduced to. He was Former coming city from somewhere too, else, and, and uh, he was going to go undercover and do something. That's the first police, black policeman I remember. Mm -hmm. Now, what about Asians during that particular time? And it's we didn't have any. Didn't have any. Didn't so have the, any so the first affirmative action piece was the, was the, was the African American, or black cop. Yes. And, okay. and uh, the prostitutes that worked in the Albana district always felt safe in ha having Asian customers because there weren't any Asian policemen. Mary Taylor up on 14th and Kellysworth. Asians were welcome. 
part, big part of her business. Hmm, interesting. The cooks, the business owners, the restaurant owners, the Chinese restaurant owners, they were all customers of that. But they weren't looking for Asian policemen. They weren't. They weren't. Or there were no Asian policemen. I mean, so. this was Portland. You've got to so look at it like, let's be real. Portland has been a very white place for a very long I mean, it's still it's a, a very city. white no, place. It's but at, it was, and I guess <laughs> it has not always been hospitable to bringing everybody in to okay. a decision making part of the And that's city. history. It yeah, doesn't. All that's it right. means is Portland's just pretty much okay. the racist okay. Portland has always mm-hmm. been that we're trying to change out of. How, how are we today? How do we, how do we how do we rank today? You think today? As as in as far as an inclusive kind of a city. Mm-mm. Define inclusive, and because I could take inclusive kind of several well, ways. Well, we we got we've got we've got black police officers on the mm-hmm. force. We've got Asian. We got mm-hmm. Hispanic. I mean, we've got a, a as as it's being said, a very diverse, if you will, city. Okay, so. Here's when we say diverse. If we're still 80 some percent white, okay. and you got Native American, Latino, Asian, African American, African, I put I put African and African American into one group. Don't split us up, please. That you didn't say black. African group. and that's African a American. Group. You know that. Now. We'll that's, talk about that's another. Subject. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that. I'm gonna say <laughs> African American. All of us. That means in this, that's like dropping four, four or five different colored sprinkles on top of some whipped cream. <laughs> Ooh, it looks diverse, but guess what you still got a lot of? Whipped cream, so that's kind of, you know, relative. <laughs> that's a beautiful example. And that's, that's a good deal, that's a good deal. I'm okay, going to steal that. Don, what, what do you think? Besides the whipped, whipped cream, what, 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 what are you saying? Well, the diversity... I've never had any problem with the diversity in black people, even gay people. Uh, I still have a problem with the women. When come on, man, yeah. Like no, I'm telling you, he's married to one. Don't I'm married trust to me. Woman. Okay, yes, but yes, yes, yes. one of the big problems was that an officer, and they still do. If if I've got a call here on a road robber or a problem, and I'm going to get a cover, and the cover turns out to be some girl, mm-hmm. then I got the same problem I had. Before I needed cover, now I got a girl to protect. Okay. And like it or not, that was a prevailing feeling okay. of the officers. And the other thing was, all these cops' wives, they didn't want another a woman sitting in the police car with their husband for eight hours. Well, she's a, day. a cop. Wait a minute. She, no. Come on now. Huh? And they all know that partners get really, really close anyway. No, they don't and do so that. They weren't that's part of training. The wives were not that. for it. Ninety-five percent of the cops were not for it. Okay. And if it hadn't have been forced on them by a lawsuit, they wouldn't have done it. But that just kind of means like women are sex craved, and this man I sit next to every day, and I know his every bad habit, I'm going to be attracted to him. Or generally, he's a fat slob, and I'm in shape running every day, and I could do karate, but he's worried if I'm backing him up. Mm-hmm. Those are, I mean, I can understand, like you say, traditionally how you look at those things. You but want a little girl to come and help. When you're in I, trouble. You know what? <laughs> you know what? If if a little girl is coming to help me when I'm in trouble, I will take that. Now, if it's an officer, I'm sure two things are happening. One, she's above 21. Two, she's past the aquatic academy. And three, she could probably shoot. So if she if she can qualify those three things and I'm in danger and I need help, if that's what you call a little girl, okay, yeah, I want that little there, girl. There's another problem right there. Is they're too quick to go to shooting. Most hey man, police, you know most how policemen are now too quick to go to shooting because most of them, because yeah. because they're scared. Because, they don't, because they're scared exactly because they're Coward. scared. Mm-hmm. Policemen used to be hands on. We didn't have a taser I could stand 15 feet away and electric at you. Mm-hmm. You had to go. You had to do hands on police work. And women are generally not suited for that here's what I would type ask, of... Here's what I would ask I'm you, I'm going to wrestle you to the ground and And before you, you get to answer that question, I'll make sure Don cleaned it up. You know, see, it's not girls you was talking about. It was women. Yeah, yeah. Straight I up, you know. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry. Sorry. Here, okay. But here's no what I do say. If you could show me a statistic that said women officers are more likely in responses to shoot unarmed individuals more than men officers, I would get with you. But I, but I have yet to see in the talking points of anyone where they say women are they can and they da, 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 and then they pull out statistics. It's really, I just culturally don't like it. It just doesn't feel. There's right. YouTube videos of women police officers just getting the shit kicked out. I of seen a YouTube. I seen a YouTube. I, I seen. I seen. Oh, wait, wait, I'm gonna give you this one. I seen a Facebook World Star uh, tape of one black guy 
socked the crap out of two officers while his friends taped. Now, mm. both of these guys were at least six foot, 210, 220 pounds. So what I would ask you then is this, who's weaker? A woman getting knocked out by a man or two men over 200 pounds getting knocked out by a man? It's all relative. And what it really speaks to is how we objectify women. <laughs> Another thing it speaks to is my generation. Yeah, that's true. I will not disagree. That's why we had this fun conversation. <laughs> well, you know, but this the, is a clash of generations. But, but as I'm sitting here, as I'm sitting here, represent the the lay person aspect mm -hmm. of it. I'm asking my question. I'm asking the question. Who who comes up with the definition as to how do we go about recruiting? I mean, the discussion that we that you, no. you guys have been. I'm I'm listening. I'm saying somebody something's wrong here somewhere. You mean? You mean to tell me I've got representatives that are basically having these discussions and I'm out here having my problems? Yeah. Now the question is, why aren't you calling them and making your problems their problems? Well, I'm going to call them during this election period. Don't wait till, don't wait till then. <laughs> no, we have don't, to. No, you don't. That's you the call, system. You, you no, find no, your no. elected official, you get at least 100 people and all y'all call once a day for a week. Your problem will be their problem. Okay, once they're weak. Okay. You're right. You're right. It's a squeaky like wheel that? gets the grease. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that the way we do it? Hold the feet to the fire. Are we doing I'm that today? To You're out there in the marketplace. Are we doing that today, Royal? No. The market is showing us that by the fact we get mm -hmm. substandard quality products, whether it's social services, whether it's law enforcement services, whether it's education, access to health care. Well, Roy, I got to ask I you a question. Field. I've got to ask you a question. I mean, you, you, you seem very, very knowledgeable. And with the background and the whole nine yard, as if to say you were you were at many of these discussions and you're doing them on a daily basis. What's going on? We don't I, have. I, I mean, I'm sure you you probably have been in situations where you've had the opportunity to talk to the chief or the mayor. Or, I mean, just that kind of environment aspect of it. Are they taking it in? What's up? Because that's, in all due respect, as a public, that's what I'm. That's what I'm basically saying. That's why these people are there. That's their job. That's how they eat. They're supposed to be responding to the thing. You're listening to this stuff, and that's what I'm hearing you're saying. Mm -hmm. But then I'm still getting the same old, I don't want to use the word, but you know. I mean, I guess you have to look at it and ask yourself this. How many terms can a Portland City Mayor officially get? One. Two. Two. So Two what three. you're asking somebody is to make seismic, substantial, <laughs> structural change to not only institutions, how people view the institutions, the mechanisms that promote the institutions, those who gain from those institutions. You give me eight years to change all that and do everything else. And oh yeah, I got to make sure people like me. I got you. I got you. Yeah, and that's um, so. That's when we come up with the word community policing. You got to get the public involved in the process. You have to get an informed, intelligent electorate. Mm -hmm. Well, mom's going to get out there now and, and starts talking to the kids. That's what I'm hearing you saying too, right? Everybody, uh, everybody has to talk to, to everybody. Everybody's got to do their job now. Mm -hmm. Okay, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Is that what we? Is that the direction we go? Is that the direction we're going into? Uh, we got Donald Trump running for president. You tell me what you think. <laughs> now, well, Donald, that's a, that's another. Well, we we need to have another talk. <laughs> I mean, the, the moment Donald made the point about the immigration issue aspect of it, I do think that what, was a whole different ball. But game. what I do think it runs into is the fact that we have traded celebrity for conscience. And as long as we do that, we're headed to hell in a handbasket. My only thing is this. I got my water hose, so hey, I'm cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, that's a different, that's, a, that's another discussion that we yeah. should have. But, uh, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm not, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going to say something uh, that, that I don't understand to a certain degree. Because when he first came, when Donald Trump first came out, he targeted, if you will, illegal immigration. And uh, in all due respect, the, the law was broken. Now, the definition of how that law was broken, that's sitting on the table. But no one said anything, and then all of a sudden, the public, then it started having some impact on other people's eats, jobs, jobs, started impacting other people's jobs. Mm -hmm. then, then, then all of a sudden, you've got all these folks, when I, and, I, and I'll make a point, I'll make a good point. You know, uh, when you think about, and I think about the race and some of the other folks, we got, we got uh, uh, Partridge, uh, Jamie, Jamie Partridge, who's now lobbying, if you will, for 15 bucks an hour wage rate, yeah. okay? And he jobs. I mean, 15 bucks is just not enough, if you will, to survive mm -hmm. from his perspective. And as a small business person, I can't, as a small business person, most small business can't survive hiring someone at 15 bucks. Mm -hmm. So there's no, because so the definition of a small business is not about the Income. 10 or 12,000 an hour, you know. 125 you, employees. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is that we, we weren't the, the small <coughs> business guy, and that's the person who has to come up. But at the same time, I'm saying jobs is still an issue. And so 
in the construction industry, the same thing. Uh, you know, you, in all due respect, there, many of the contractors will utilize the, the, the illegal immigration piece because they can, they can mm -hmm. work them for nothing almost. And then guess what? The individuals who are over here who were working those jobs and not about to work, as we will. Then you got the criminal justice system. Here's the, I mean, I go on But and on. here's the fallacy about that. But then I the just, other thing, too, the most, and then here's the other most important piece, and I'll be right up front mm -hmm. from a personal standpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't speak Spanish, mm -hmm. but I'm now required to speak Spanish. That's good. In the, it's not good That's for me. Good. Understand what I'm saying. I'm 77 years old. I'm, I'm, I'm yet to learn how to speak English, let alone. <laughs> here's the thing. There's a, couple, there's a couple fallacies in there. The first fallacy is about illegal immigration and where they're coming from. The majority of the people who are illegal immigrants and the vast majority who are coming now, it is because they are overextending visas, not because they're jumping a border. Second of all, they just shown that actually people coming to the United States from Mexico is decreasing which means the worry about that border isn't really as much because they see we have idiots trying to take control so they don't want to come. Yeah. But like I said, I, and the I, third thing, my last thing about, my last thing about is about language. My last thing is about language. Yeah, good on. And, 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 I, and I say this proudly. The biggest reason we don't promote Spanish is the average white person doesn't speak Spanish, not because it doesn't benefit other people of color. If you really want to look at Spanish, Spanish outside of, in, outside of any native African language. After Portuguese, Spanish is the most populous language for people of color. More black, over a hundred black million black people speak Portuguese in this hemisphere. In this hemisphere, over 90 million people speak Spanish. There are Spanish people everywhere from Costa Rica all the way up through the, uh, south, the uh, eastern coast of Mexico. Sp Spanish is just as much our language as anything else. Well, what about, the other, the, things, what about one, the other languages? I, are you going to just throw them out of the game? What about Russian? Here's the deal. What about, what about here's the deal. we got about 100 different deal. languages white in people, this state. For, I know this. From the time I was in school, white people taught me Spanish. I, French, I, I spoke Spanish, yep. I, German, and all these were, you know, the main French, reason French we learned these too. is because these were the predominant colonization languages that happened in Africa and South and Central America. Now, here's my deal. Everybody was geared up on that. Now, if the paradigm changes as the world changes, oh well. Now, what you have to ask yourself is, do we get caught up in an Anglo-Protestant paradigm where we just value this one particular view, or do we become global citizens and accept and embrace everything that's been us that we kind of been not using? Because if you got 40 million black people in America, 90 million in South and Central America, that means 130 million. If we could all speak Spanish, guess what happens? Then we can figure out how we can economically come together. Then guess what we can do? We can meld with the African community. And right now, instead of doing a Chinese immersion class for black kids, we should do a small immersion class. Because one in five black kids in Portland is African. So until we really look at how language impacts how we see each other and quit using language to say somebody who looks like you is different. Growing up as a kid, my favorite baseball player was Roberto Clemente. It took me until I was older to realize he didn't speak Spanish. I mean, he didn't speak English. And really what attracted to me him? was his humanitarian aid and he looked like me when i was a little kid the reason i stopped liking jet magazine all the latin black baseball players who was dark as my grandfather didn't get counted as black guess what happened then we lost part of what makes us great and who we are globally i mean you could be a citizen of the country and do all that it's kind of shallow hey well in all due respect you know as i said that's quite a discussion yes sir and we have to respect everybody for that matter mm -hmm. and, and and that that is, is it's not nothing negative one way no, or another nothing negative I mean, anyone can have their opinion mm -hmm. and you, and we should all respect those a lot of times folks tend to say, well i don't want to respect your opinion no you respect everyone's opinion at the end of the day it becomes a vote yeah, if you got exactly. 10 people in the deal and if it's voted this way i guess hey you live with it if it's not voted that way, I mean, one could stress out. <laughs> you <laughs> no could stress out and you won't eat and then come another problem. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But the bottom line is that that's another issue. We'll but again, it. we'll get to that. <laughs> the fact of the matter is um, we have, we've had some, I think we've had quite a discussion here on the whole issue of, of young people and gang and this, mm -hmm. that, and the other. <laughs> And, and the, old, the other thing of police. And I, and then I would say to the viewing public out there, uh, you too can have these kind of discussions. It's very, very important. We happen to have, a, we're in the political process at this point in time, and like, and like, uh, like Royal has said, and like, like, like Don has said, and like I've said in many ways, you got, you got one of two options. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna have a vote. <laughs> and, and if not that, you can run for office. You can run for office and cite your views and whatever. Mm -hmm. You can put your feet out there and you can knock on the doors. 
And if, if you win, guess what? That becomes the platform for your tenure. Yep. The right? Key, yep. The key is we just promote an informed electorate. I think that's the, the way for that to happen. People have to be informed and realize that they can do everything you just said. Okay. Yes, yes. And as you know, yeah. we got a presidential election coming up, so naturally a lot of folks are going to be coming out because they're going to get a lot of stuff in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> you get a lot of stuff in the mail. You may even get some of those leftover turkeys. You, you, you never know to vote <laughs> for so and so and so and so. So the bottom line, people will be getting involved, but I would suggest very strongly that you read what you see. I mean, I, I'd say go to voters' pamphlets as, a lot, as mm -hmm. opposed to a lot of that stuff just coming into the mail, and, and try to see if you can get to that person and share your views. I mean, that's that's a very very important piece. Because this is a very critical election at this, this point This election time. is very important. Very, very because, important aspect well, of it. Because the mayor is not going to run, so we need to f see who is going to run. Um, I'm very unhappy with the governor's situation. Uh, I thought I think that Kids Harbor should have stuck around a little longer. I don't like the governor we have now because she was never elected. And she was she's a governor by default. So we need to have a governor that has been elected by all the people. I don't agree with their policies. Some of the ones on gun control I think are stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to elect a governor. But again, we need to elect a mayor. We need to elect a commissioner that cares. But people are going to have to step up to the table. People are That's gonna, the key. Well, you know, I've that, always that's said the if key. You, if, if you, you don't know. step up to the table, you may have this person sitting out there, well, this is the person yeah, that I, yeah, I okay. want. But for some strange reason, now we've documented all stories. Everybody has stories. Mm -hmm. And people, right off the bat, and, you know, in any political process no. if you will of running for office the first the first group of first money that they set aside for the group are investigative reporters to find out everything about you yeah is there a story out there that i can use against you now, this person may be the best person in the world mm -hmm. we all had stories but the fact of the matter is so all of a sudden the folks who could actually maybe do some things won't run because hey i don't want anybody to know what my stories are in my closet so then you end up with guess who Whoever can be articulate, blah, 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 for the moment. Mm -hmm. But then when it gets down to solving the problem, like some of the discussions we were having at this point in time, it never gets discussed. You don't have the, the, the politicians going around and actually dealing with these young people out there and asking them the question, well, why are you a game member? Dealing with a cop or dealing with affirmative action, all this other different stuff, right? Is that fair? And that's the population. That, that's the, those are the majority of you that are sitting out here listening to this program right now. You got to get involved. The voters are the answer to the problem because if they don't like what the city's doing, change the leaders. If I've always said, it's in the book, if you don't like the way your police department's working, fire the mayor. Yeah, fire the mayor, but you got to get another works. one. He works. <laughs> he controls the police. Right. If you don't like it, get rid of him. That's right. That's right. Get that's some right. change. Do something. The police department needs to be or reorganized yeah. in any case. They've mm -hmm. been... Uh, they're doing some things right, and they're doing a lot of things that shouldn't they shouldn't be doing. Uh, they're over specialized in some ways, and uh, I've written a, a reorganization for the for the police department plan, like a five-year plan, to study it and see what they need to be doing. Uh, I would get rid of un un one-man cars. They'd go. One-man cars are dangerous. Mm -hmm. I know there are too many policemen that say, "I got hurt waiting for backup." Mm -hmm. I don't ever want a Portland policeman saying, I got hurt waiting for backup. So what would you say is the ideal number of port police for Portland? I think they should, well... If you, if you had the magic wand, how many would you have in town? I'd hire another thousand, because then we'd have some detectives that would do the work. We'd have some cops that are that are new. We got There's too many guys retiring. What are we going to do? Like I said right here... You guys are stressed out too quite yeah, a bit. Yeah. Uh, Whole, uh, 40, uh, we're way behind in the number of policemen we have. Uh, there was a whole lot of policemen retired, several hundred, couple of hundred policemen retired, and, and, uh, and then only seven were hired. So you can't keep that up. You've got to have some policemen that are going to come in. You can't, you have to have inclusive tests for everybody. Everybody has to take the same test. There's no different tests for white people or different tests for black people like they were. Uh, the old black and blue report, which we're going to talk about at another time, mm -hmm. says that the tests were slanted. No, they never were. The black people that took the tests and qualified got hired. I know the cops by name. Dick Bogle was just one of them. So if you can pass the test and if you want to be a policeman, you can get on the department. They're hiring. Mm -hmm. They have to hire. We need more policemen. 
Let me ask you about that on that, safe. On, that same, on that same note, Royal aspect mm -hmm. of it. Now there are many black officers on the on the police department throughout the country, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Are they looked upon from the standpoint of the negative, the anti-police type? Are they in an anti-police version? What's the rationale with them? I joined the police department. Well, it, would it would depend. It would it would depend. I think it would minutes. depend on what your value of the police is. Like me, mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends who are officers. Yeah. I know black officers now. It's it, it's an honorable career. I, I think I shall quote Tupac as I often have not in my life, but I choose today. It's not that anyone is against police. Okay. They're there to provide a service, an honorable service. Right. It's bad police officers. The ones whose behavior dictates they're not honorable. And that includes those who silently are complicit in hiding the actions of those other officers mm -hmm. who I'm are sure. bad. Now, if you're not one of them, people probably like you. If you are one of them, you're probably the person people don't like. Well, no, aren't they taking that in consideration when they're going through training? I mean, yeah, it, because they have a, a a year and a half probationary period now. They've got a a long time to decide whether the person is going to. But work. most people are just going to do it. Go through the probation and still have that same deal. Yeah, well, once they get into the main deal, so you can get on. But I mean, but that um, code of silence is is it still there? Yeah, sure. It it's is. still there. Yeah. So I guess my question is. How would you? Yeah, how would yeah. the gang that protect? How would you want people to respect the gang that protects people if they act like the gang they're chasing? You're, you're right. You're right. You can't. You can't have thugs in any. You can't have thugs that are black thugs that are killing people. You can't have white cops that are thugs. thugs that are, are killing thugs. people. Don't leave thugs that part out. Thugs don't leave that part out. That are killing people. If they got, if they got a badge, they're just as bad. Exactly. Okay. Well, gentlemen, this has been quite a discussion. I want to thank both of you guys. Really, I mean, I point of that. It, it, I think hopefully to the to the, the viewers out there, hopefully they can maybe respond by by inquiring a little bit more and talking a little bit more than other folks. And just talking, right. to, just having this chat like we're doing. There's and an it, election coming up. Yeah, definitely. They need to pay attention. They pay attention to who yeah. is coming up in the front yeah. of your doors and say, elect me. Yeah. Whether it be the city of Portland, all those folks and whatever, or even me. Maybe if I might consider my doing it myself because I'm still frustrated. Okay. I'm frustrated. And, and so, well, I we ran may, for sheriff in 2006 yeah, yeah, yeah. in Multnomah County okay, good. because I was frustrated. Right. Well, gentlemen, thanks again. It's been a pleasure and hope to see you again for sure. Yes, Ron? sir. Okay, good. Folks out there, again, have those conversations. I'll see you next week. Take care. Have a good one.